Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Eh, bienvenidas y bienvenidos a la orientación teórica número 6 de problemas del cine y el audiovisual en Latinoamérica. Eh, bueno, hoy para esta orientación teórica tenemos la inmensa suerte y el lujo de contar con eh, uno de los autores de los textos que ustedes tienen para, para leer para esta semana. Eh, se trata de David Martin Jones. Eh, María Soledad Montañez, la, la coautora, también eh, estuvo invitada, pero por razones eh, que tienen que ver con sus tareas y con su labor cotidiana no, no puede participar, pero David sí puede hacerlo. Así que vamos a contar con su participación, que, que es un lujo, que es algo que muy pocas veces hemos podido tener aquí en, en Argentina. Y también va a estar con nosotros Carmela Marrero, eh, que es especialista en cine uruguayo. David Martin Jones es profesor de Film Studies en la Universidad de Glasgow. Eh, se ha especializado en el análisis del cine contemporáneo, en el cruce con problemáticas como las identidades transnacionales, la ecología y el antropoceno, entre otros asuntos, en un contexto mundial de globalización. Y Carmela Marrero es maestranda de la maestría de estudios de cine y teatro argentino de la UBA y miembro del grupo de investigación uruguayo GESTA. Así que, hechas las presentaciones, eh, les agradezco mucho a los dos eh, por estar aquí y le dejo la palabra en primer lugar a David Martin Jones. Eh, welcome, David. Eh, now it's your turn. Thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much, Pablo. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share screen now and put a slide presentation up. There we are. Can you see my, uh, yes, okay, the slides are there, that's fantastic, okay. Okay, so thank you very much, first of all, to Pablo for this extremely kind invitation to speak at the University of Buenos Aires. This is an honor for me, uh, I'm delighted. Also to Carmela uh, for the interest she has shown in our work. And I say our, as I'm really here to present on behalf of myself and uh, Maria Soledad Montañez. Um, we are a co-writing team when we work on Uruguayan cinema. Um, we, are, we were partners uh, when we started, but now we are sort of husband and wife. Maria Soledad Montañez is super busy today. She's organizing a conference, in fact, so I'm delighted to be able to speak on our behalf. And I hope that maybe in future I'll be able to uh, attend at Buenos Aires and, and meet some of you. So I'm going to speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, and I'm going to talk about four things. Uh, having more problems with the slides. Okay, here we go. I'm going to speak about four things. First of all, Uruguayan cinema, why we started writing about it, some of the work we've done to date. Secondly, the idea of Uruguay disappearing on screen and also in the scholarship on Latin American cinema, or maybe sort of not appearing in that scholarship. And this is perhaps the most interesting of the articles we've written, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, a piece called uh, Uruguay Disappears. And this includes the idea of something which we call auto erasure, which you will have a chance to read about, but I would just unpack it today very briefly. Thirdly, I'm going to talk about one of the other recent works we've done. Uh, we've just published it. Um, it may be the last piece we do, we're not really sure at this moment, and that's on the low-budget horror movie La Casa Muda, which some people might have seen. It's quite a gripping, uh, thrilling story. And this is part of a special issue of a journal, which includes Uruguayan scholars and uh, UK scholars, as well as interviews with Uruguayan filmmakers. And then finally, just at the end, just a little bit to talk about where all this leads us to in terms of an understanding of uh, world cinema, or as I prefer this term, a world of cinema. So I'll be saying a world of cinema. It's a bit more of a mouthful, but I prefer this to world cinema because world cinema has this uh, sort of exoticizing Eurocentrism attached to it. In the West, people talk about world cinema and the way they talk about world literature, world philosophy, uh, world music, world food. And what they really mean is uh, something from the rest of the world that isn't Hollywood and European cinema, if it's cinema, or just the rest of the world, if it's other things like food and, and that kind of thing. So I'm trying to get away from this exoticizing of the other uh, with this term world cinema. So I talk about a world of cinema. Okay, before I begin, uh, a quick note on some things to bear in mind. This is co-research work. So you are looking at uh, sort of white middle-aged 
uh, man here, but this was written with uh, a Uruguayan woman and that needs to be remembered, even though they can't be here to present. Secondly, this was written over a decade now. So there's, I was going back through the, uh, the various articles last night and today and refreshing my mind on what we'd researched and written. And I realized that there's parts of this scholarship um, and the research we did on things like very specific issues around industry and so on, which I can't really remember particularly well. So there'll be some moments in here where I say this is from memory, but do have a dig in and have a look. So don't necessarily take my word for it, have a look at the detail in the article. And then finally, and we'll talk about this when we get into the questions after the presentation, I think um, some of the questions motivating our research, and some of the frames of reference, the intellectual paradigms that we use, these shifted with time. And uh, that's something to bear in mind as well. The, the way we think about the object of study, Uruguayan cinema in this instance has changed over the years. The final caveat of course is if Soledad was here, of course she's much better looking than I am, but still you get to have me today. Right, these caveats aside, Uruguayan cinema, why did we start to write about it? The big why? As you might imagine, there's a strong autobiographical motivation. Maria Soledad Montañez is Uruguayan and living and working in a UK university. She felt that it would be good if academic scholarship on cinema included Uruguayan films. And after watching a few Uruguayan films, I felt the same way. And what motivated me in part was very different. It was that I was also researching uh, Scottish cinema, or really we should say films made in Scotland or films that represent Scotland, Scotland on screen, if you like. And there is a degree of parallel between the two small nations, and this is important for the kind of paradigms that we use with our thinking. There's parallels in terms of the number of films produced, the size of the population of the countries, uh, the size of the industry of the countries, the importance of international reception for the success of the films. So often in both Uruguay and Scotland, if you make a film and it does well on the festival circuit, all the critics at home go, oh, wonderful film. But if it doesn't, all the critics at home go, terrible film. So this is some sort of common uh, feature between the two. The types of images and how the small nations are represented have some similarities. And this is curious because these two countries are very, very different in many ways, not least geographically. They're very different places. And then finally, there's the relative absence of academic discussion of both of these small national cinemas. So there's lots of parallels. So this was why I was interested. So I said there was a strong autobiographical motivation. Perhaps we might call it a personal motivation on the, behalf, on the part of both myself and my co-writer and researcher, Maria Soledad Montañez. But even if it is personal, because in, in the West, if you say, oh, that's very personal research, that's almost a sort of not an insult, but it's kind of like a slight. Um, it is very personal. But this fact also relates to how academic scholarship is produced more generally, I think, and the role of the dedicated individual ensuring that lesser known areas of the world, whether it's Uruguay, Scotland or wherever, are brought into the light. So this is a bigger issue I'm trying to indicate here, and it's something we'll get to again at the end of this talk, around the decolonization of the academy. I'm not sure how much people are talking about that, this in other parts of the world, but in the West, we, we, you know, we're aware we need to try and decolonize the academy. So who decides to write about what and where in the world they're writing and in what language so often shapes how much knowledge we have about the world. So even though these were very personally motivated researchers, um, the personal, as the old saying goes, is also political, as in we wondered if we didn't do this, if this would ever happen. So that's perhaps what's hanging over this whole research project is we're trying to get people aware about something uh, which we think might not happen otherwise. And since then, we've produced about six co-written pieces, um, which you can see listed on the slide here. Obviously, the, the print is far too small for you to see this, um, but if you pause the video, you can have a look and see what you might be interested in. And there are two pieces here that have been translated into Spanish and the full references are there. So hopefully you can get hold of those and they, they might prove useful. And this includes most recently a special issue of the journal Studies in Spanish and Latin American Cinemas, which I'll come on to discuss in a moment. Um, and this is the first sort of collective work on Uruguayan cinema in English, at least, and it incorporates work from both UK and Uruguayan scholars. And when we come to the questions at the end, I'll go through some of these works in particular in a little more detail to draw out how the intellectual trajectory of our thinking changed and developed over these several years. And I can speak at that point about the different models and paradigms we used in a bit more depth. But for now, that's the panorama. Let's look at the one piece Uruguay disappears more specifically. 
This was published in Cinema Journal. That journal has now changed its name. That might be useful to know if you're looking for it. I think the, the journal is now called the Journal of Cinema and Media Studies, but I think most people will be aware of this journal. It's probably the biggest or one of the top two in the world, along with Screen. This is an article about the film uh, Gigante, sometimes translated as giant, but I often see it circulating just as Gigante. Uh, and it was made by the production company Control Z, Control Z, Control with a big Z for someone like me, in 2009. And the argument in this article develops at the intersection of the film's aesthetics and its industrial production and distribution. And we thought that understanding these two dimensions in tandem seems to be the key to understanding the film itself. The theoretical paradigm which we found most useful in helping us situate the film was that of small cinemas, which was an area of study which was uh, developed really in the mid 2000s, led in part by the scholarship of Meta Hjort, who's a scholar, and Duncan Petrie, who's a, a scholar. Of, uh... And as I noted a moment ago, initially I was working on Scottish cinema, so hence I recourse to this small cinemas paradigm um, for the study of Uruguayan cinema. And this was due to the close parallels that I outlined with Scotland and Scottish film. But what we found in this piece, and this was the second piece where we were using the small cinemas paradigm. In the first piece, we kind of took it as red. But in this piece, we ended up realizing that the small cinemas paradigm needed to be sort of shuffled around a little bit and tweaked and, and developed because of the specificities of Uruguay. So I think that was quite a nice thing. We were able to help progress the thinking on this um, through the Uruguayan example. And this is hinting towards something we'll come to later about what can we do with this idea of, of Uruguayan cinema in relation to bigger ideas and, and a world of cinema? The key idea which we developed in this article was the idea of something called auto erasure. And it's ironic, but to describe auto erasure, I need to start by describing something else. But we think that the idea of auto erasure is an idea which can help explain why many Uruguayan films look like they do. It is also an idea which has great applicability across many of the cinemas of the world, whether large or small. So I think this is related to a Uruguayan film and Control Zeta in particular, but also you could, you could use this idea of auto erasure to describe a lot of, of different cinemas. The idea of auto erasure, as I said, I have to describe it by talking about something else first. So it develops in contrast to a different existing idea. And this is the idea of autoethnography. So the idea of autoethnography is drawn from the work of Mary Louise Pratt, who wrote a very famous book, which a lot of people know, called Imperial Eyes in 1992. And this is an analysis of travel writing and colonialism. But this work on literature has sort of um, resonated around the world. And it's really a book about transculturation, which is that famous, even older idea from the 40s by the Cuban uh, Fernando Ortiz, even though I think a lot of people in the West have perhaps really only encountered it through Mary Louise Pratt. But the idea of autoethnography suggests that colonized people will often knowingly sell products to their colonizers, which appear much as the colonizers would expect them to appear. So touristy trinkets, for example, and they will be in effect stereotypical products. But for Pratt, this is not simply a colonized culture embracing their subjugation, as though they kind of hadn't realized what they were doing. Rather, it's the autoethnographic work will include a degree of knowing critique or satire on this very use of the stereotypical. So it's a very knowing use of the stereotype. And a helpful example that she gives, and this is from memory. So again, this is a moment from memory. So dig into Pratt if you want to get um, a very specific one. But I remember her talking about a rug from Peru, which is sold to tourists who go to Peru. And to the colonizers eyes or to the Western tourists eyes, it appears to represent Peru by indigeneity in ways that they might expect to see traditional costumes, for example. But for Pratt, within this depiction of indigeneity, for the Peruvian eye, there lies a more complex discourse on how Peru is being represented. So with this idea of autoethnography, uh, when it's used in relation to films, it expresses much, much the same idea. A film may represent a nation to international eyes, uh, much as the external viewer might be expecting to see it. So the filmmaking nation may, in effect, self-exoticize. But nevertheless, in so doing, it may also provide a degree of critique of the stereotypical view. And this might be something more easy to detect if you are living in the nation, more for the, the national viewer's eye. But there's a definitely a sort of knowing register of address, rather as there is in an ironic address, 
or words spoken with a sort of a knowing wink. And this happens a lot in Scottish films, so it's quite a useful one to think about in that respect, around this thing called tartanry, um, which is, you know, when you see people from Scotland wearing uh, tartan kilts, maybe in, in the highlands, in the countryside. And of course, most of us in Scotland don't live in the countryside, we live in cities, and we very rarely wear tartan or kilts. Um, but of course, to the tourists, these things seem very typical. So autoethnography in a, a film about Scotland would be that people would go to a Cayley or a social dance and they'd wear kilts and it would be in the Highlands, even though none of these things really happen very often in a person's life, perhaps once every few years at a wedding, you know, something like that. Um, but an also ethnographic view of that would be in a film like American Cousins, which I wouldn't expect you to see, but it's a film which, in which the characters in the film go to a Cayley, but uh, some of the characters in the film are Scots Italians, so they are diasporic, and in the film, one of them in the Cayley sings a song in Italian. So to the outsider eye, it's a Cayley, a Tartanry in the Highlands. But to the national eye, there's some kind of nuanced attempt to portray Scotland a bit inclusively by representing its diasporas amongst the national identity markers. OK, so that's how autoethnography works. What about then auto erasure? Auto erasure, by contrast, it's kind of the opposite of this. And we coined this term to try to explain the very deliberate erasure of all indicators of national identity from the image, the attempt to represent a place as though it were a non-place or an anywhere place or just anywhere. Now, this practice is not unique or particular to Uruguay, not at all. Many small national cinemas do this, but as far as we know, this was the first time that this practice was labeled in a way that we could kind of grapple with it. Auto erasure, we argued, is a way for a small national cinema to ensure that its films travel more widely on international distribution circuits, such as the International Film Festival circuit. The idea here is that there's no markers of national identity that might get in the way of a viewer's appreciation of the story. Rather, viewers will believe that this story is rather like their own story of a life under globalization in which all places begin to look a bit similar. There is no sense in a viewer's mind that they're missing something or some significance. For example, if you set a film and you have an establishing shot of a statue in a square, then if you don't know what the statue is or what the square is in that city, you might immediately start thinking, am I missing something in the film? Is there something I should know some significance about this square? Was it the site of something significant historically? Who is the person on the horse? Is that important for what I should understand about the events taking place around it? So all of these questions can be removed from the mind of the viewer by removing all these markers of national identity and having, well, a lack of establishing shots is a particular aspect of auto erasure, but in, in essence, allowing people to get into the story in ways that they can feel that they can uh, you know, associate with the characters as if it was their own life effectively. Right, as I noted, the argument has two dimensions, the aesthetic and the uh, industrial. So the aesthetic, in terms of aesthetic, it's very easy to see auto erasure, I think, especially in a film like Gigante. Gigante contains no markers of national identity and its primary setting is a supermarket, which renders it a story uh, taking place in a global non-place or anywhere. And yeah, you could, you could argue, well, you know, what about the language on the packaging and these kinds, but they're, they're small things that really only reduce it to a certain part of the world. They don't really reduce it to Uruguay. In terms of industry, uh, this is a little harder to see, but it is also there if you dig. As you can read in the article, we interviewed the producer of Control Zeta, Fernando Epstein, and he spoke about the importance of filmmaking, which avoids any too political a story, so as not to be pigeonholed when it comes to international distribution. And he is wary of labels like Latin American cinema, he doesn't really like that label, or didn't when we spoke to him, and also didn't even really like Uruguayan cinema as labels because they can ghettoize the films. They can sort of minimize the potential audience. And the idea there is to keep the appeal as broad as possible to maximize uh, revenue by appealing to as many people as possible. And this is why I think, as we know, even in Hollywood films, big directors of Hollywood films and so on will come out and talk about a film in the most general broad way. And they'll say, this is a film about love. And you know, it could be a film about a lot of things, but love is something we can all appreciate. So you watch it. Okay, in addition to the fact that, you know, um, 
Epstein is saying that you, you know you want to avoid any too political a story, and that's the case in Gigante for sure. Uh, the film is also an international co-production with Argentina, but also Germany and the Netherlands, and it draws on funding from a variety of international sources, including the International Film Festival circuit. Now, again, from memory, so you'd have to dig into the article, but I think the Hubert Balls Fund, which is out of Rotterdam. So the intention then is to recuperate this, all this international funding through the international sales and to maximise the chances of doing that or to erase the nation so no one is put off by the fact that well, maybe I've never really heard of Uruguay, I don't want to see a film about Uruguay, well, but I'd like to see this film about uh, people in the, who work in uh, the kind of jobs that many people work in now. So this is a work of auto erasure then, a universal story. Can we talk about universal stories? Well, I think it's an attempt to be universalising so that anyone can watch it, so as to maximise profit from international audiences. Okay, and I think in the questions we'll talk a little bit more about some of the nuances around that, but that's the argument in brief, so I hope that's helpful when you're doing the readings this week. I'll move on now to the third. I said there was four points today, so this is the third point. Um, this is the journal special issue which we published more recently of studies in Spanish and Latin American cinemas. I wanted to talk about this a little bit because this is where our work kind of has got to and maybe where it rests. And here again, the idea of Uruguay disappearing takes centre stage. In particular, the journal issue was devised to fill a gap left by the relative absence of discussion of Uruguayan cinema amidst all the scholarship on Latin American cinema, why is there so little on, on Uruguayan cinema? Whilst it does make sense that there's a lot of scholarship on bigger industries such as Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, even so, there's so little on Uruguayan cinema, but there is work, much more work on other comparable film industries we found when we dug, um, you know, at the time, I can't remember all the examples now. So the first idea here was to make Uruguay appear in the debate rather than disappear and in discussions around Latin American cinema. But we also wanted by this point in our thinking to bring together scholars from the UK and Uruguay and create what's sometimes discussed as a, a hermeneutic circle. And again, in the, in, the, in the questions we can get at this because there's a lot involved in that. Um, but I think it's the, it's the right way to proceed, but uh, it has a lot of complexities around it. Now in this particular issue, the piece we wrote was about La Casa Muda. Um, this is a low budget horror film, which has since been remade in the USA as The Silent House. And the fact that it was remade in the USA is important as we'll come to find. Low budget, I think it was made for about 8,000 US dollars or something like that. So um, it did extremely well there, I think. What is interesting about La Casa Muda is that its disappearance of Uruguay shows us something a little different about the film industry and the aesthetics of genre movies, as opposed to the more festival film oriented works like those of Control Zeta. And this difference also indicates something about how we must understand Uruguayan cinema as being not just one thing, but several things. Um, it disappears Uruguay because this film is nearly all set in, a, in one house and it's like a horror film. So again, it, 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 sort of, it could be anywhere. Um, certainly there's nothing particularly Uruguayan about it, if you like. Um, at first glance, the journey of this film to international distribution seems very familiar. So it premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, after that, it gained wider distribution. And then finally, it got a US remake. So this is a sort of similar story to other films. So a more art house or festival film oriented work like Gigante or other Control Zeta films, you'd expect them to get some festival funding, a bit different from the Casamuda, but certainly premiere at a festival and from there go on to get wider distribution, although you wouldn't really expect a, a remake, it, that's true. But if you dig a little bit different, there are quite a lot of differences. And I have just isolated three to talk about today. First of all, unlike Gigante, La Casa Muda was produced with money from the television industry, or rather you would say that the director and producer worked in the television industry and used their own money to make the film. So that's very different from how a, an art film like Gigante goes and gets its money from international uh, funding sources and festivals and that kind of thing. Secondly, this film gained international traction long before its premiere at Cannes, and that would be quite different from a film like Gigante as well. The filmmakers were very astute, and uh, they put a teaser trailer on the internet, I think it was just YouTube, I think, have a look in the article, um, and this attracted the attention of Hollywood. 
and one major came to them and said they'd like to buy the rights for the film but if memory serves again it's, it's in the article i think they insisted that it should not be screened in its original state so it was almost like we'll buy the rights to this film we'll remake it but you never show it i think that was the kind of deal they were offered now fortunately for all of us they they said no to that one and they premiered the film uh, at Cannes, and then they got a hit movie that they deserved of course and in the end, there was still the remake in Scotland. So in a sense, there's, there's a win for everyone there, I think. So the third difference would be the imagery in the film. So Ben, the, we've done the industry, let's do the aesthetic level. So it initially seems reminiscent of many Latin American films about recent history that use imagery to sort of allude to things like, for example, uh, the history of the disappeared or the children of the disappeared, very sort of um, difficult, challenging topics to talk about. But ultimately, the story then it sort of leads you to start thinking like that. But then through the imagery, it doesn't actually have that resonance. It has something a bit different. Ultimately, if there is a hidden message about recent history, it's not quite that uh, recent history of dictatorship, which is all, almost a sort of history that's come to define uh, some Latin American films, which is perhaps why producers like Epstein don't like the idea of Latin American cinema, because they think it's about this political past, maybe. Um, but it's not this particular version of history that you're ultimately led to think about through the film's imagery. Rather, it's a more sort of universal idea about, again, challenging topics, topics like abortion, incest, and ultimately gender. And these could all be related to a Latin American context, yes. And I appreciate that the way those issues are dealt with in different parts of the world are very different. But equally, there are also issues that, you know, could be engaged with by anyone from anywhere. So in this article, once again, we're discussing the disappearance of Uruguay on screen, but in a very different way due to the pleasures associated with genre films and indeed due to the film's very particular emergence and pathway to distribution. So the fourth thing to talk about and the final thing to sort of broaden the discussion a bit beyond Uruguay as we round off is where does this work on Uruguayan cinema lead us in terms of our understanding of a world of cinema? In particular, in the context of moves to decolonize academia in the West, in the wake of movements like Roads Must Fall, um, <clears throat> Black Lives Matter, we're supposed to be acknowledging much more the, excuse me, <clears throat> acknowledging much more the so-called global south, as it were, the global south. Um, so where does this take us? Well, one of the things which is telling is my co-writer is not here. My co-writer is now working with um, community engagement with immigrant communities, uh, Latin American immigrant communities in the UK whilst working in the university sector. So that's interesting in itself, isn't it? Somehow this research can lead you to think, should we be talking about cinema or, or doing things with people? But certainly I'll carry on doing this. And in a recent solo publication of my own called Cinema Against Doublethink, um, which was published in 2018, I incorporated some of the co-written work on Uruguayan documentaries um, which Maria Soledad Montanez and I had produced in the past, but I incorporated that research to, to put those documentaries alongside other films from various parts of the global south, which all attempt to do something similar. And I think that idea of trying to see what's going on and include Uruguay in there was what I was really trying to get at. And what they're all trying to do that's similar is to reclaim lost histories which have been eradicated in this instance, due to the Cold War, in the instance of the documentaries I was, I was talking about. Now, I don't have time to go into this in any depth, but we might get to it at the end of the questions, maybe. But this is a project about how we might see a world of cinemas as a vast repository of the world's memories. And these world's memories can illuminate for us histories of the world, which are disappeared, lost, but they're histories which are much longer or wider in scope and more recent national histories. National histories, of course, being quite a recent invention, a couple of centuries old. So if you like, I'm trying to think about how we can see in a world of cinemas, transnational histories or world histories, if you like. So I looked in particular at um, the history of colonial modernity from 1492 onwards. Can we see this history in films? And, and yes, actually, if you look in a certain way, you can. Again, histories of the Anthropocene, can we see the history of the earth rather than the history of human history? And again, I think you can. And one way to think about what we can do with a growing understanding of Uruguayan cinema, it's like this. It's to see its interactions and interconnections with other cinemas from around the world. And this can help us determine where there is a much bigger picture in a world of cinemas that can come into focus. 
some of the other articles I've listed here take a, a, a similar direction to try to understand a world of cinemas. Um, and this is really then where I want to try and today. Those other pieces, they don't really have Uruguayan cinema in, but perhaps still they're, they're interesting if you want to think about how we can approach a world of cinema. And that's really where I want to end today, because really this is kind of the point where you will pick up with your own work, whether you're looking at Uruguayan national cinema or whether you're looking at Uruguayan cinema in relation to the world. So how can we approach Uruguayan cinema now? What's the most useful way? Um, these are just some of the ways. There'll be others. You can think of others. First of all, there was the hermeneutic circle, which um, we put together when we did the, the special issue. And uh, yeah, it was, it was very rewarding, but also has its challenges trying to work in that way. There's also a lot of scholarship by some other uh, new uh, entry-level scholars. Uh, Dr. Be uh, Beatrice Tadeo Fuico has written some fantastic work on Uruguayan cinema, including a book in Spanish. And what's really good about her work is her uh, ability to archive, and get access to filmmakers and to really uncover a history of a national cinema uh, with perhaps without a national film industry for much of that time. Then we could do what I've been trying to do, look at Uruguayan cinema in relation to something bigger, whether it's Argentine cinema, co-productions or Latin American cinema, regional, or just the world cinema, which is what I've been trying to do. And then finally, the study of Uruguayan cinema is long overdue a piece or pieces on, on the women filmmakers. Um, so those are some possible ways. And, for now, I think I'll take a break there, as I think it's time to start wondering what, what you think about all that. Um, and perhaps after the break, we'll come back with some questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, David, for this interesting and mobilizing ideas. Eh, vamos a pasar al, al español eh, para darle un espacio a, a Carmela, también que viene investigando estos temas en, en sus tesis de maestría. Uh, and they, I will tell you, tell you about what is saying Carmela. Uh, it's fine, if it's fine with you. Uh, Carmela, uh, adelante. Bueno, eh, primero, bueno, saludos a todos. Buenos días, o buenas tardes, o buenas noches, como dijo Pablo. Este, es, es, para mí es eh, un placer y estoy agradecida también por la invitación de Pablo y por la posibilidad de, de, bueno, de conocer a David, que cuando uno lee ¿no? tiene una imagen este, fantasma, entonces materializar la imagen está bueno y escucharte es, es bueno también eh, por eso mismo, ¿no? por, por la posibilidad de ponerle rostro a las palabras. Eso por un lado. Eh, por otro lado, me parece que, que está bueno también celebrar estas posibilidades virtuales ¿no? y estos encuentros, y ojalá que, que post pandemia esto pueda seguir sucediendo, porque son ta, esas cosas buenas que, que, está, que está bien rescatar y que es necesario rescatar. Y por otro lado, bueno, y ya yendo un poco más al tema, este, me parece que estos encuentros, entiendo yo, creo que en un rato vamos a hablar un poco más de esto del círculo hermenéutico, pero creo que estos encuentros eh, conforman parte de ese círculo hermenéutico, que la posibilidad de cambiar el idioma del inglés al español, del español al inglés, son también este, parte de ese círculo hermenéutico, y que es necesario que, que así sea, ¿no? eh, poder entre todos dialogar desde nuestras lenguas, y, y también hacer de eso una forma del conocimiento, me parece que es bien interesante, y bueno, y en parte me quedo de, con esa idea del círculo hermenéutico porque cuando leí el último artículo y encontré esta categoría, este, sentí que un poco fue lo que me pasó a mí después de leer los trabajos que, que Soledad y, y vos, David, han, han escrito y han hecho, y cómo esos trabajos fueron este, un disparador y una forma de interpelar ¿no? desde, mi, desde mi lugar de nacionalidad uruguaya y de investigadora uruguaya, las formas en las que uno, eh, las que yo particularmente pienso, este, la construcción cultural del, del país. Entonces me parece que es, fue, fue muy importante para mí leer esos artículos, porque la idea de que el Uruguay desaparece, o que la identidad nacional del Uruguay desaparece, es una, es una idea muy provocadora. Y eso es importante, y es interesante, porque es la provocación también lo que mueve a la reflexión. ¿No? Entonces, bueno, en esa provocación me sentí como inquieta y un poco interpelada para buscar, bueno, cual, cuáles son los caminos para pensar esta idea, que, que por supuesto tiene mucho sentido, ¿no? eh, si, si uno la, la asume y la lee desde un lugar transnacional también de, de estudio, pero qué pasa cuando esa misma idea 
es puesta en diálogo con este, elementos locales, de la cultura local y, de la, y del devenir cultural del Uruguay. ¿no? ¿En, qué, ¿En qué lugar queda? ¿Cómo esta misma idea puede o no dialogar con los procesos locales y culturales de Uruguay? Y bueno, y por ahí vino un poco mi, mi inquietud y mi investigación, no para contraargumentar, ¿no? no para ir en contra de la idea, sino para complementar ese estudio desde un lugar y desde una perspectiva más situada en el proceso histórico y cultural del país. Este, y bueno, y ahí el, el análisis este, un poco que, que, que surgió en, en mis investigaciones a partir de la lectura de tus trabajos, fue pensar qué pasaba con el proceso de identidad uruguaya en las últimas décadas del siglo XX y en el momento bisagra del siglo XXI. Y también, si se quiere más en extenso, ¿no? cuál ha sido el proceso histórico de la construcción de la identidad de un país que surge este, a mitad del siglo XIX, ¿no? y cómo esa identidad también fue un proceso de construcción este, eh, condicionado por procesos colonizadores de la historia de, del Uruguay. Eh, bueno, es, es, eso ya plantea y complejiza, complejiza este, ya de por sí la construcción identitaria de los uruguayos y de muchos de, y de los países con sus particularidades y diferencias latinoamericanos. ¿no? Este, pero particularmente en Uruguay se dio un proceso que también mencionas en un momento en el artículo que es como bueno, el exterminio de los indígenas, también se dio un proceso este, muy interesante, muy importante, de, de marginación de, de las diferencias culturales y étnicas, ¿sí? de la negritud, del gaucho. Uruguay ha sido una sociedad que tendió a este, invisibilizar muy fuertemente todas las diferencias étnicas y culturales con el, el, el modelo este, europeo como horizonte. Y esto ha generado algo que, que parece que no es que estoy hablando otra cosa, pero tiene mucho que ver, que es que la, la construcción identitaria uruguaya ha sido un tema de reflexión constante y continuo en la cultura nacional. Entonces, desde el principio del siglo XX, con la generación del 900, con Herrera y Reisí hablando de tonto video en vez de Montevideo, después con Onetti pensando en que Uruguay es solo una gran extensión de tierra, que es un gaucho, dos gauchos, 33 gauchos, ¿no? y de ahí el nombre de la revista, 33 cines, un poco tomando la frase de Onetti, este, después pasando por el cine más militante y político, y, y por ejemplo, como el Uruguay no hay, ¿no? un documental este, muy este, crítico de la construcción nacional, de aquel, aquel modelo de, del estado de bienestar vallista, y después, post dictadura, transición, y políticas neoliberales <coughs> eh, económicas, que acompañaron también un proceso de globalización y que generaron otras reacciones, además, ¿no? que se sumaron la postdictadura y bueno, y ahí surgieron otras cosas, como por ejemplo, bandas de rock and roll, Cuarteto de Nos, este, parodiando a Artigas, ¿no? Y entonces la canción El día que Artigas se emborrachó, o El Oriental Desertor. ¿Qué, ¿Qué quiero decir con esto? Que yo también, a partir de, de, esta, de, de la propuesta ¿no? de analizar cómo el Uruguay desaparece, he pensado cómo el Uruguay ha intentado construirse sistemáticamente. No, no solo desaparece, sino esta, la cuestión identitaria uruguaya es parte de la propia identidad. Preguntarnos por quiénes somos, cómo nos construimos, es parte del de, eh, ser uruguayo. Porque ha sido sistemáticamente cuestionado en diferentes momentos históricos y ya en los 90 se cuestionó desde el campo cultural y muy fuertemente desde el campo intelectual. Entonces ahí surgieron, a, a principios del siglo XX, XXI, este, un, un conjunto de investigaciones que, que ponían ¿no? en el centro de, de la cuestión, bueno, ¿cuál es la identidad uruguaya? ¿Cuáles han sido los relatos? ¿De qué estamos hablando cuando hablamos de esto? Y se transformó en un tópico que, que por lo menos atravesó mis años de formación, ¿sí? ya ahí a, a principios de los 2000. Este, entonces, bueno, un poco mi, mi intención fue pensar en, en la investigación que estoy haciendo, cómo estas categorías de lo Uruguay desaparece pueden dialogar con una historia cultural eh, local, ¿sí? y de qué manera eso podría complementar también esa otra lectura transnacional. No como algo que se contraponen, sino que se complementa. Y bueno, creía que contarte un poco esto y hacer un aporte desde ese lugar, también saber tu opinión, si te parece que, que puede ser... Este, un camino de investigación que, que, que sume, y, y yo creo que, que 
que eso para mí, o sea, leyendo un poco esto, se, sería también ir construyendo este debate, un poco este debate Spanglish, ¿no? eh, que, que vaya uniendo las voces de los distintos investigadores desde los diferentes lugares de lectura, ¿no? que también le, el conocimiento situado tiene, tiene también una importancia al momento de observar y, y analizar el objeto de estudio. Bueno, por ahí, Pablo. Bueno, muchas gracias, Carmela. Eh, es interesante esta discusión y este debate porque eh, la cuestión que tiene que ver con la lectura situada de los objetos culturales llamados películas es uno de los temas que estamos abordando durante la cursada, la cuestión de lo nacional y de lo postnacional y de lo eh, transnacional también son temas que, que nos interesan mucho, de cómo se sigue o no expresando una idea nacionalista en, en los cines eh, de cada uno de los países de Latinoamérica, es otro tema que estamos trabajando, así que bueno, eh, las dos propuestas, las dos, eh, las dos exposiciones, tanto de David como de Carmela, nos llaman a pensar sobre todo esto, así que vamos a hacer un pequeño intervalo, eh, Vamos a comentar algunas de estas cosas eh, off the record con David y Carmela. Y después vamos a volver con eh, un nuevo encuentro eh, en el cual le hemos hecho algunas eh, preguntas compartidas. Hemos diseñado algunas preguntas compartidas con Carmela para eh, hacerle a David y que él nos pueda comentar su punto de vista sobre estas cuestiones que nos interesan tanto. Así que nos tomamos unos segundos. Y volvemos. <tose> 